Seminar at Fulton State University. My name is Chris Monsieur. I'm a faculty member here in Civil and Environmental Engineering. Together with my colleague Robert Tini, Miguel Fiorenzi, and Jennifer Dill, and John Lee, we co organized this Friday Transportation Seminar. Today we're very pleased to have Franz uh, Mullenhurst from the City of Bellevue to talk to us today about uh, ADA inventories. So, with that, uh, go ahead and take it away, Franz. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me today to present um, uh, this, this subject matter. Uh, by way of brief introduction, I've been involved in the transportation industry for 18 years now, both as a consultant and uh, in various government agencies. And for the past eight years, I've worked at the City of Bellevue and on a number of interesting projects, one of which we'll talk about today. Uh, we'll, we'll begin the discussion with a review of of the Americans with Disability Act. We'll talk about various methodologies for approaching the requirements there and the one that City of Bellevue chose and uh, where we're at in the project and how it's influencing our day-to-day -day operations. So the Americans with Disability Act of 1990 is a far-reaching civil rights law uh, for State and, state and local government agencies, there are some very specific requirements that we must ensure that individuals with disabilities are not excluded from program services and activities. And this includes pedestrian facilities. So what this means for us is that we are required to undertake a self-evaluation of those public rights of way to make sure that they uh, meet the standards of the ADA. And once we identify barriers, we need to include them in a transition plan, which identifies how we intend to go about addressing those, those barriers. Aside from the legal um, requirements, City of Bellevue is committed to ensuring that accessibility is available to all of its constituency. Of the 120,000 residents, 15% of those are known to have a disability of one, one nature or another. And looking to the future, we foresee this to be an increasing trend with the aging demographics that we, we see. So in terms of our approach, looking at, looking at the elements of what's in a, a sidewalk curb ramp inventory, there are numerous uh, data collection requirements. Now, this is a, a small sampling of the variety of different assets that are, that are required in undertaking this kind of an initiative. And the, the guidance is fairly limited. Uh, the document reflected here, Designing Sidewalks and Trails for Access, is a 1999 document. Uh, these these illust uh, illustrations from the document show the, the level of technology that's, that's, that's uh, being offered as guidance. When you look broadly at who's approaching uh, these kinds of inventories, you, you typically find a, a simple yes-no clipboard type inventory approach. And, and in fact, this uh, NCHRP project indicated that indeed there's, there's a lot of um, ver variety and variability in approach and interpretation of what's required. For, for the city of Bellevue, we, we determined that the, um, that, that the level of precision offered by those simple yes-no clipboards really didn't meet our standards. And so we wanted to look at what, what it would take to, to do a, a, a robust data collection effort. So in the summer of 06, we undertook a, a preliminary two-week assessment of what it would engender to use survey-grade equipment. And w at the end of that evaluation period, uh, it was clear that that kind of an initiative would be uh, very expensive for us to undertake on the order of over a million dollars for our 336 sidewalk miles. So that wasn't really an option since we really would prefer to spend our money on fixing the problem than inventorying the problem. So we looked at other available technologies and that's when I approached the Federal Highway Administration with this idea to adapt the uh, inertial profiling system, and I'll talk more about that, um, to a, a smaller footprint, uh, a Segway-based platform. And 
and the, it was well received as an idea and in fact we, we at that point set in motion a, a research partnership that uh, undertook a preliminary assessment in the summer of 07. It proved to be a viable technology and then subsequent to that summer 07 work we ended up making some additional refinements to the technology and then in the summer of 08 we were able to inventory our entire 336 miles in a two-month period and uh, I'll cover the degree of precision that this technology offers which is superior to what you would find in a simple yes-no clipboard fashion. So, The partnership that was established involved uh, four parties. City of Bellevue was uh, in the lead. Uh, Federal Highway provided the technology, um, both the hardware and software uh, interface. Um, this was offered, or uh, this the Starodub engineers was retained to provide that assistance in fabricating the unit that we used. And King County Metro, the transit agency in the region, provided the staffing support that uh, the two inventory people that we used in the summer of 08. They have a, an interest in this because of their access paratransit requirements. So it's a sim simple three-step approach. Uh, the first phase we've completed, it's a data collection effort. Uh, two different people out in the field, one doing curb ramps, one uh, monitoring sidewalks. Right now we're analyzing the data and I'll cover some of the preliminary findings from that. And finally, the, the, all of this information will be uh, captured in our transition plan, which will outline how we intend on addressing these barriers. Throughout this entire effort, we've engaged the disability community. That's a requirement of ADA. So let's take the two different elements of the, uh, of the data collection effort, first being the curb ramp inventory. Uh, this approach, these are the, the tools we used in the curb ramp portion. Uh, we, we went out in a van, the Segway unit was unloaded, and then the bicycle. And uh, the, the person on the bicycle had a smart level, this handheld GPS unit, and a tape measure. And these are the attributes that were looked at. Um, uh, dimensional and slope variations in curb ramps. So here you have uh, the measurements being taken and entered into this handheld unit. The GMS2 was, was uh, particularly useful. It enabled us to create a, a series of pull-down menus of the various attributes. We made some refinements to it. One thing that you, you always get with the literature is submeter accuracy on the GPS. The reality of it is that it's not as accurate as, as they lead you to believe. So we took a different approach. We included in the um, units uh, orthophotography and we created an ArcPad interface. So instead of relying on the GPS to give us the coordinate of the curb ramp in question, we would actually place a dot on the ortho image to indicate precisely what curb ramp we were um, referencing. So otherwise, you could very well have a dot when you pull it into GIS that's in the middle of a house because the GPS is that inaccurate. So that was a refinement that we made throughout the, the process. And, uh, and then the other benefit of this particular technology, it had a, a digital camera included in this unit. And this is the data dictionary. Uh, associated with the various curb ramps. Uh, in addition to the curb ramps, the person on the bicycle also uh, was responsible for looking for fixed obstructions in the sidewalk and narrow sidewalks, both of which are also issues uh, of accessibility. So on to the sidewalk inventory. Uh, as I mentioned, the Federal Highway Administration, uh, we approached them because they have extensive experience using inertial profilers. This, is, this technology has been around since the 70s. It was, came out of GM labs. And typically, the platform is, uh, is on a, on a van-type vehicle used in the aerospace industry to measure um, landing strip, smoothness, pavement surfaces, as well as in the highway industry for uh, measuring uh, roughness indications. And basically, we, I approached Federal Highway and suggested the possibility of adapting this technology to a smaller footprint uh, for the purposes of 
accessibility compliance. Uh, they, in, they were intrigued by the op opportunity to partner in this and, and, and develop this unit on a Segway platform. This, this, uh, this graph here illustrates the, how the degree of accuracy when you compare the data from this unit as it relates to um, other um, rod and level survey instruments. So you can see it, track, it tracks very favorably. So the component parts of it, uh, you have a sensor box um, that includes a, a military grade gyroscope, an optical trigger, it has GPS, it has a distance measurement instrument, and it also has a displacement laser. All of this helps to capture uh, variations in the surface texture as well as grade and cross slope attributes. That then is uh, captured on, in, on the computer through a data acquisition card as it moves along at a rate of six miles per, uh, six, six miles per hour. Uh, it's sending out, um, it's capturing data at a rate of 10,000 records per second. So the degree of precision is very accurate. And this is a representative output uh, from the data acquisition. It's ge basic geometry in terms of the, um, the data. You calibrate it based on the weight of the individual. A at the start of every day, you make sure that the tire pressure is consistent, the PSI, so that it doesn't vary the, um, the dimension of the, where the laser is proximate to the sidewalk surface. And then the gyroscope takes into account variations as you move over the surface and, and the bucking and heaving that might arise from going up or down hills. So these are the attributes that are specifically identified in the uh, guidance, in the ADA guidance that we were capturing with this unit. Running slope, cross slope, changes in level, faulting, and, uh, and protrusions and obstructions. Because we're dealing with a new technology, it was critical throughout this effort uh, that we field validate the results. And we did this not only during the course of the summer of 07 when we initially tested the technology, but we did it every week throughout the summer 08 initiative as well. So you, here are some images of, of the field crew going out to various test sites to determine, uh, indeed, using a smart level, um, w w to what extent it, it was proximate to the results coming from the, the ULIP, the ultralight inertial profiler. And this, this shows some uh, readings both from the smart level in a blue and uh, in red the ultralight profile, inertial profiling system, and then this is the in orange what the compliance requirement is. So this is cross slope and this is running slope, what we usually identify as grade. And then this is the test site in question. So you see, you see subtle variations, but in general the, it tracks very close to what the results are. So looking at the, um, some of the issues that we dealt with in terms of how do we take all the data and then process it. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we needed to make a determination on was what would be the appropriate <clears throat> window size to make a, an assessment of the data. This graphic illustrates um, how in, the, when you, in terms of analyzing the data, depending upon uh, how, how far apart you set your grade window, the effect that it can have on the output file. Um, with one, one foot grade down to 50 foot grade, you can see up at the top, there's a gradual dampening of the data results as you increase the, uh, the grade window. So for us, it was critical that we, we, we stay up in the upper range so we were sure to get the result, accurate results. Otherwise, everything would come out compliant. And so uh, we looked at at what guidance was available and it was determined that a two foot interval was the appropriate one to use. And so this is a, a moving average window that we look at whenever we're going along the surface area. And that's, that's the smooth profile that, that comes out of this. So let's look at the, uh, the different uh, elements. Grade, this is what uh, the Americans with Disability Act uh, guidance is, uh, basically looking for areas of 5% or greater are deemed a ramp feature. 
And so what we ended up doing at that point is making an assessment of what are the different characteristics of the various ramps out there. And this, this is more along the lines of what, what defines a ramp. Um, we came up with different categories of ramp classifications. Um, this classification of one, one was uh, anything that was greater than 5% grade, but uh, that didn't fall into these other categories. 30 represents a rise of 30 inches in a run between 30 and 50 feet. Um, six represents uh, a rise of six inches, six to five feet, and so on. And then here you have, at, at the most extreme, instances where you have uh, uh, a rise of 1.5 inches over a one foot, or, or 12 and a half percent grade. So. Here's the, uh, an illustration of, of the Segway operating over a surface. When we come, bring it back into the um, geometry uh, processing shell, we end up um, going through all of the data and all of the feature sets get classed in each of those ramp types. So we get a, a very accurate interpretation of what the geometry is. Looking at um, the ultralight inertial profile as compared to smart level readings, again, I was saying how important it is to have accuracy um, in, in the results. And this, this is another illustration of how it tracks very closely to the smart level readings, the output files. And then repeatability is also key whenever you're uh, using a new technology for QAQC. And so again, this is four different runs along the same area, and they all track very closely to what you're looking for. And then this is when you bring it into GIS. These are all those various ramp types, class by color. So now we move on to cross slope. Uh, the ADA requirement is 2%, no, nothing greater than 2%. <clears throat> and here again, we see four runs over a surface and again, tracking very, very closely with the results of a smart level reading. And this is what the output record is. And here we see, um, we, we classed them between uh, one to 10, um, one being two to 3%, uh, 10 being 11 plus percent cross slope. And then faulting, uh, ADA speaks to uh, anything is some, anything greater than a quarter inch is construed as, as, as um, needing to be identified as a barrier. A uh, quarter to half inch, and then uh, three quarter inch uh, to one, and then one plus. And these are the, these are the uh, attributes that get coded in the output file. The, the individual in the field, when they're operating the, the ULIP, at the end of their run, they actually, they're presented with a, a visual image of what faulting they experience along the pathway. If, you don't, if, you, if you've gone over a surface with two big bumps, as is, the refle as is reflected in this image, it, you get a visual confirmation that the results are accurate. So you have on-the-fly validation of, of the results. And then, again, we did field validation uh, putting this on ortho imagery and then going out in the field and taking a look to get confirmation that indeed the results were accurate. And then finally, protrusions, obstructions. Uh, the ADA speaks to the need to maintain a clear passage of 36 inches. That's actually moving toward a more of a 48 inch. And we, we use that as our benchmark because of the direction that uh, the access board is moving toward. And then Protrusions, um, you're, you're needing to make sure that um, this zone is a protected zone. So we looked for instances where any features were encroaching in that protected zone. And these are a variety of different kinds of obstructions, whether they be um, stationary or movable. We, we tested in the summer of 06 voice defect logging. This is video logging. You were, we actually were able to in code, um, we, we used video and, and went along the surface and, and entered in verbal cues. It, unfortunately, it, it, it didn't prove viable. The GPS signal came in and out. And so we, we actually dropped that uh, when we went into our actual inventory in 08. Instead, we, when it came to movable and 
obstructions and protrusions. We use key press events on the keyboard so the operator would go along and key press it, enter, entering information. And driveways, I'm going to cover in detail uh, why this is an important attribute to note, but we would note that at the midpoint of all the driveways. So this is the, the software uh, interface that gets, uh, that wherein we, we process all the, the raw data. And in the summer of, uh, in the summer of 07 when we tested it, this is, again, GPS signals, not particularly uh, uh, accurate. Um, so we made some refinements in, during the summer of 07 that, that gave us um, a better uh, tracking, but it wasn't proximate to the sidewalk. Um, we've at, with additional funding from Federal Highway, we ended up finally getting a uh, system that tracks very accurately to the sidewalk surface, not relying on the GPS at all. Um, we use um, the distance measurement instrument and the gyroscope to help inform northing and eastings, and that in turn helps us get um, the, the line work so we don't end up spending a lot of time post-processing and getting the, the line work to conform to the ortho imagery. And then, and then we add all of that data to it after we get the line work done. So looking at um, roadway grade, there's some attributes about roadway grade that are really important. Um, clearly in an environment like this image where you have an 18.5% per roadway grade, there's only so much you can actually do to make this compliant. And in, and in fact, the uh, guidance uh, acknowledges that, that it's, uh, rec it's recognized that in situations like this, you can match the grade of the general grade of the adjacent roadway. So how do you go about um, screening out data like this, particularly in a hilly environment like Bellevue? Well, we, we have thankfully a digital elevation model where we, ab where we have um, the, where we're able to identify what the roadway grades are and we cross-reference that with the, uh, the roadway grade that the, this, that the data is giving us and in those instances where the sidewalk grade uh, doesn't conform to the roadway grade where it's, it's, it's um, greater than the roadway grade and above that 5% that threshold, then we make a determination whether or not something else might be going on there. And so this is an instance where, where, we, um, where we saw um, an interesting variation in the data. Uh, because here we see an instance where uh, the roadway grade is actually less than 5%, but the sidewalk data um, was in excess of 5%. So we were curious to find out well, what would explain that. And indeed, when we went out in the field and looked at the, the environment, we see this deviation in the sidewalk surface that uh, differs from what the sidewalk or what the roadway grade is. And that helped explain why that variation occurred. And, and indeed, this, this feature set would then be identified as a, a barrier in our data in the transition plan. So that, that that exercise, this is, these are some preliminary findings. Basically, when we went through the, this roadway grade analysis, uh, we started off with about 137 miles of non-standard grade data. When we screened it against the digital elevation model, um, we were able to greatly reduce what would be deemed um, necessary to address. And that was reduced to 33 miles um, that could, um, basically 100 miles of it could be explained because of the adjacency of the roadway grade. Driveways are another unique feature that, are that was really important for us to take into account. And as I said, when we went along the surface area, we, um, we key pressed entered in the midpoint of all of those driveways. Um, here's an example of, of what kind of results you can get at the flares, 9.3% uh, cross slope, 36% grade variation. Clearly, the, as illustrated in this uh, cartoon image, um, it can be a real issue for people in, in wheelchairs. So what we did was uh, we have all of this data of where the driveways are, and we looked at this data separately from all of the other 
data that we're analyzing. What we're finding is that, indeed, the most um, extreme values of, of uh, cross-slope and grade are attributable to, uh, when, when you get into this 8-plus percent uh, cross-slope area, that the majority of those uh, congregate around areas where you have um, where you have driveways. That it, in instances of 11 percent plus cross slope, uh, 71 percent of those occur at driveways. So, w how we're using this information, it's uh, informing how we do our um, design standards. What we're basically um, making as a priority for us is that we. Uh, create a level landing across all those driveways to minimize the impact of, of these uh, feature sets. So now that the data has been compiled and we're processing it and working through it, um, ultimately what we're going to do is, is have this be the interface that everyone in the city has access to. It'll be a web-based mapping interface. Uh, whether people are working with utility agencies, or others in where construction work is being done in the field will be able to pull up the imagery and identify what the problems, barriers are. And as we make requirements on uh, our Puget Sound Energy and other utilities or when we do work through our capital improvement program, we'll be able to reference this data and inform how we go about addressing uh, remedies. The interface will be set up in a manner that you can l identify uh, screen out specific issues, here's heaving issues, here's grade issues, here's cross slope issues, uh, where the curb ramps are, and you'll be able to click on all of the curb ramps and it'll pull up all of the details associated with um, those curb ramp features. And this will be the when you have all the data together. So at this point, we're, we're initiating project prioritization. Now that we have all the data, where do we prioritize improvements? We're working with our partner, King County Metro, who provided funding to the staff who went out in the field um, to go out with uh, several paratransit vans to test locations. We'll look to uh, the disability community for guidance on what are the most uh, challenging feature sets for them, and they'll enter this information in, an, in a form. We'll have a series of focus groups, and then we'll compare their information to the attributes that we have from the data set and we'll target those areas with the greatest um, deficiencies. And then we'll evaluate it as a series of GIS layers in relationship to proximity to transit, proximity to uh, government agencies, proximity to social services, and that in turn will help inform where we program asset improvements. At the City of Bellevue, we prioritize ADA. We, we have um, a lot of training for, of our staff. We have a, a culture of compliance is the term uh, we use to de describe how we approach the Americans with Disability Act. It's part of this umbrella. Uh, we have uh, an ADA coordinator and staff from all the different departments meeting uh, regularly to assess where barriers are and how to address them. This, this was a contract released on February 17th uh, to work the, in 2009, a half million dollars to address curb ramp repairs. In the past two years prior, we've spent over a million and a half on curb ramp uh, uh, fixes. We've also been implementing a number of innovative approaches, other innovative approaches. Uh, here we're using rubber sidewalk panels uh, that help um, around locations where you have tree heaving and uh, of the sidewalk, and we're assessing to what extent this minimizes the, uh, those heaves at those points. Uh, one of the benefits, like Pergo, you can pop up these panels and trim back the trees. So we're, we're evaluating this as a technology uh, to address some of those problem locations where we have valuable tree assets, but we also want to maintain clear passage. Um, there's a lot of construction in Bellevue, and we prioritize access through construction zones. Here's a temporary ramp. Here's an instance where we have made, um, extended a sidewalk around a, a fixed obstruction, and uh, we're regularly 
um, replacing um, sidewalk where it, there's heaving issues. And we also have an education outreach component where we notify uh, neighbors to keep the path passage clear. And we also have a uh, online presence uh, in the form of accessibility requests that people can can weigh in on where their <laughs> problem sets. So that that pretty much concludes what we're doing in the way of ADA. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have at this point. So uh, we are planning on, um, we're meeting actually with King County Metro this next week to identify who from their access uh, pool of, um, would participate in this, this outreach effort. We anticipate doing the, um, going to these test sites um, mid next month and, uh, and then we'll, we'll be uh, integrating that information with the GIS data set that we currently have. Hopefully, the final ADA transition report will be wrapped up in June with all of the information on where <coughs> prioritized improvements need to be made. Um, that. First, just a couple comments. I'm really glad to see somebody looking at um, the issues. <coughs> I can stop choking. Um, looking at the issues around accessibility with um, wheelchairs, and just for you city planners and planners and engineers to understand that, that that cross slope is one of the hardest things to deal with in a lot of times because I only have one arm to push with essentially. Um, and uh, secondly, is that uh, uh, obstructions um, are really more prevalent than you might think. You walk around the city, some things that you guys don't notice, like can't, just simply can't get by. My question pertains to, and <clears throat> this has to do, if you've looked at some of the light rail uh, addition that's going in downtown, and uh, the way they put the ADA ramps, or the, <clears throat> the interface at the corners in, in here, with the full 90 degree curve, what that does <clears throat> is essentially eliminates the cesspool that develops at the bottom of the ramps, my question is, has you, have you given any thought to drainage um, for existing ramps? Because what happens is that water likes to, you've got two things coming together. You've got the slope of the street coming down and the ramp coming down, and <clears throat> it develops pretty much just a base in that whole water. I mean, this, this wouldn't be such a problem if we didn't get as much rain in the Northwest, but hey, here we are. So I'm just wondering, have, have any of the planners, designers, it's a it's a known issue. Uh, we I, I can't at this point in time give you a, a design template that that would work in each and every instance. And I think it I, I think that's the I think that's an important thing to be aware of that it's really not uh, enough to just take a, a design standard and plop it down. Uh, I think too many um, non-standard feature sets are actually created with the thinking that you just take out a template and put it down and it will work. Uh, you actually need to approach each and every one of these as a unique design uh, study and look at it in that way. Is anyone commercializing this at all, or has, is there any consultants? I mean, you guys did it to the city of Bellevue. You did it yourselves. Is there any consultants doing it to other places? At this point in time, we are the only jurisdiction um, to make use of this technology in this way. There have been a number of other jurisdictions that have expressed an interest in this approach because of the degree of data precision and the rapidity with which you can get it done. Like I said, we were able to complete this inventory uh, once we worked out all the bugs. <laughs> there was a, 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 lot of, a lot of trial and error, but once we actually worked out the bugs, 
this past summer, we were able to complete 336 miles of sidewalk in two months. Uh, and the degree of precision is, is unparalleled with other approaches. So it's just now getting wrapped up. So I expect that as we get invited to other events, I'll be presenting at the American Public Works Association International uh, Conference in September. I expect we'll, we'll start to hear from a lot of other jurisdictions who are also interested in approaching their ADA compliance efforts similarly. <clears throat> Did you or can you use this method of assessment in wet weather conditions? Very good question. That is one of the limitations of the technology is the laser system can't, um, is compromised in a wet weather environment. So we, that's precisely why we um, have been using the technology in the summer months in Seattle. Uh, clearly in the drier climates that wouldn't be an issue, but in the Northwest um, we are limited in terms of what days we can operate the technology. You mentioned the 2,000 record stuck in Gattabuck, What was the length of your, of your run that wasn't limited by the storage department? Well, we, we, we basically, the interface, the, the approach that was used in undertaking the sidewalk inventory, on the laptop there was a, an arc pad interface similar to what was used on the handheld GMS2, so the operator would key press in the location of their start and end points on an ortho image. And so we, we limited the inventory efforts to individual block faces. So the data that's processed right now, like as I showed you that web-based mapping interface, um, there are 4,000 block faces uh, in, in the city in our data. And so we, we limited it in that way so that we had um, uh, it's just how we approached the data collection effort. It was by block phase. But there was no, there were no technological limitations as, as uh, we could have certainly continued to operate runs continuously. It just seemed from an organizing principle that that was the one preferred. What kind of cost savings do you think using this method um, say the city of Bellevue as versus if they would have just gone with a traditional survey? Well, this is a unique situation because the Federal Highway Administration paid for the technology and all of the support, and then King County Metro paid for our field staff. So the City of Bellevue's financial commitment to this effort was actually in the form of my time, part of my time because I'm also doing other things, but my time and uh, part of the time of a GIS person. and so. The actual financial contribution was pretty minimal. It's not an app, it's, it's not necessarily a, but if, let, let's say you took all of that together, um, the Federal Highway contribution, uh, our contribution of staffing and King County Metro's financial compute, it would be on the order of 250000 which when you compare it to the million plus we were looking at, if we were going a survey grade effort, it would have been um, it would have been considerably more. Um, so clearly if we had used a clipboard method like a lot of other jurisdictions where they basically drive by and look out the door or send people out on bikes and just say yes, no, compliant, not compliant, you could probably do this kind of an effort for, for a city of 336 miles, I'm guessing on the order of $70,000. But again, you forfeit an incredible amount of precision in going that way. And keep in mind, these are intended as um, similar to a capital improvement program. This is intended to help inform where you make investments. And so you, at the start of this, you, you want a higher degree of precision than a yes-no tracking approach. several online viewers and, and one of the questions that came up with was uh, how frequently do you envision 
redoing the survey? And is there a um, mechanism for logging new obstructions in some way? So at, at this point in time, our primary goal is to um, in, create that web-based mapping interface that will be available to all city employees. And the intent behind that is to ensure that as work is completed in the field going forward, that we update that, that, that data set accordingly. So when a uh, sidewalk is torn up and replaced, that we document um, that that uh, fix was made. So uh, ideally, there would be limited need to go out and redo this very same exercise because the tracking system would be in place. Uh, so that's, that's our hope that we'll be able to rely on, on tweaks to what data set we presently have. How many miles of the streets do you have in Bellevue? Uh, a little less than a thousand lane miles, I believe. Uh, I from your answer, I don't cannot make the decision. You help me out. Does all this, all your streets have sidewalks? No. So isn't that a more critical question to have sidewalks for the for the people that need it? But do you look at the at the walking as a mode of transportation, and are you spending the same kind of money that you are spending for the for the vehicle or travel? Um, so I, I could, I guess my interpretation of this, are we putting in an, an equal amount of effort to um, in sh building the, onto, building the gaps to the sidewalk system? Where they, where sidewalks don't exist, are we putting in an effort to address the, the gaps in the sidewalk network? Is that what? Okay. Um, in addition to managing this project, I'm also the project manager of our pedestrian and bike master plan. And so we've looked at, in that effort, where the gaps are and worked with the community in helping to prioritize where to make, where to fill in those gaps. So that's a, a separate but parallel effort. We just, this past week, uh, went to our council and they approved this, this list of, of projects in our pedestrian bike master plan. So we're doing, that. that's a priority as well. Neither of them are, are one more important than another, except that this is a federal requirement. And if you don't do this, uh, it can jeopardize your federal funding. It can leave you uh, open to all sorts of lawsuits. Um, so it, there, there's some real motivation behind having this kind of a, a documentation in place, aside from doing the right thing. rely on traditional smart level readings likely. I mean, you, technically you could take the Segway out and, and rerun the, um, the effort. We haven't worked out the details on how the maintenance will be done of the data set. In all likelihood, what I would like to rely on are the inspectors who are in the field monitoring the work as it's being completed. So they would be responsible for taking measurements and then updating the the, the web-based mapping interface. So we, um, we, we have them take ownership of that. So we'll, we'll, we haven't worked out the protocols yet, but that's something we're thinking of.
Thank you very much. Oh, you got a. Okay. question about um, in terms of like feedback and surveys um, have you sent any surveys out to like registered like disabled communities like registered disabled and got feedback from them so w like this the mailing like type of survey we early on in this process we undertook a series of focus groups uh, we, we have a, a close working relationship with a number of social service agencies that um, work with uh, these various constituency groups and um, and as I mentioned we're working with King County Metro in the transit agency has on the order of 700 uh, paratransit eligible individuals in the city of Bellevue so we are working with uh, those groups to inform how we prioritize um, addressing these barriers to access So um, the, the question this gentleman asked, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this, but you know, when you're talking about ADA requirements for sidewalks or for mobility issues, what if, I mean, is there a difference in how like the ADA would grade a city, whether it had um, all sidewalks or not, or are roads without sidewalks treated differently? Do you know, I mean, I'm just trying to understand, I mean, like, the city of Bellevue could be fined, say, because sidewalks are not um, under that 5% grade or that type of thing, but what if there are no sidewalks? How is that handled? I'm not an attorney, <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to stay away from uh, kind of the legal questions surrounding that. What I will say is that if you make a sidewalk accessible for people uh, who have disabilities, you're making it accessible for everyone. And for me, as a, a parent of young children who goes along in strollers, um, yeah, that, that was for me a turning point. I mean, aside from the fact that I also have a, had a grandmother who passed away, but she and I, when we went out and she was in a wheelchair, you know, you don't have a curb ramp, you go out into the street. That's not a safe place. And so all of us, um, I, I think know someone either close to them or um, related to them that have a form of disability that it makes it very real and um, the city of Bellevue and our elected officials prioritize making sure that it's available to everyone in the community that's aside from the legal re re reality of, of needing to comply I'm sorry, I'm not trying to get you around it <laughs> or anything like that because, I mean, I've been in on crutches and that kind of thing before, so I don't deal with it on a daily basis. But, I mean, I just didn't know if there were different regulations under the ADA for um, streets without sidewalks and streets with sidewalks. That's all. Okay. Um, the ADA doesn't speak to gaps in sidewalk. It speaks to... Um, making sure that the facilities, the programs that are available to the public are accessible to all people. So if you are providing a program and, and under ADA, the uh, public infrastructure, the uh, sidewalk environment is part of your program as a public entity, you need to make sure that it's available to all. So if you don't provide a sidewalk in an area, my interpretation would be that you're not providing it to anyone, disabled or otherwise, so that's less of an issue in the eyes of the uh, under a the Americans with Disability Act. That would be my interpretation, but again, you're getting into a, an area of kind of a legal interpretation that I wouldn't feel comfortable really broaching too much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Are you planning to do the effort even at the very low, low density area? 
Uh, we undertook our sidewalk inventory on all of, our, all of the sidewalks in Bellevue, all 336 miles. Uh, there's no differentiation in terms of uh, density. That said, you raise a good point in that when it comes to prioritizing improvements, clearly there's a, a greater motivation to make sure that your sidewalks are, are, are to standard in those locations where you are most likely to have large concentrations of people using them. So from that perspective, I think when it comes to project prioritization, those will be the areas we'll target first. Are there incentives for the city of Bellevue to have above standards? You mentioned that um, you're aiming for above the ADA requirements. Um, are there incentives to the city, more funding, anything like that? Unfortunately, it's the ADA is an unfunded federal mandate. And uh, this is not just the case for city, city governments, but also for transit agencies that have to provide paratransit service. And I've worked for a transit agency before, and I think the operating budget was on the order of 13% of their operating budget was attributable to paratransit service. So um, it, it's a sizable uh, financial commitment. Uh, there, is, there is no um, monies that I'm aware of that, that can help us address e these, these various issues I've touched on. Sure. Um, those curb ramp improvements were done uh, adjacent to areas where we were doing overlay work. And anytime uh, there, there have been legal court cases that speak to this. Um, and uh, so basically, anytime we go through and make uh, remedial repairs to uh, the surface of the roadway, there's an obligation to bring the adjacent curb ramp features up to compliance as well. And so in years past, when you know, it, it, it's variable. But that I put out there as a number of 1.5 million. That was in the previous two years, uh, the work that we had done. This year, we happened to be investing on the order of a half million. And it, it's subject to vary depending upon how much overlay work we do. Um, well, if you were to take, uh, I, I would say probably about 700,000 at this point. <laughs> well, thank you all. And before we thank our speaker for his great presentation and, for, and thank the students for actually asking all their questions, I think for the first time ever, um, students are required to ask a question in order to get credit. Uh, just explaining that. So put in a plug for next week's seminar, which will be um, a panel discussion called Seen and Heard at TRB 2009. Gail Acterman, the chair of the State Transportation Commission, Mike Hoagland, uh, the director of the Research Center at Metro, and Matthew Burko, who's a planner at Alta Planning and Design, will be talking about um, lessons learned at the Transportation Research Board annual meeting. Uh, this year, moderated by John Mackler. So look forward to next week, and thanks to Franz for his great presentation. Many thanks. <laughs>